thank you, Lord God, for allowing us to be here. Father, I know that you have everyone here that you wished to have here. There's no coincidence or mistake about our being present. So, Lord, I'm asking that you bless your word and let your word just tamper with the, uh, the hard strings of our hearts, Father God, that we will recognize the truth of your word being expressed to us this morning. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, two weeks ago, I started a series on hell. What is hell really all about? If you remember, I allowed for Jesus to absolutely give us the instruction and the definition of hell. And if anybody can remember, we started with Luke chapter 16. And you can read it for yourself. There you will find that Christ gives us pretty good insight of what hell is really all, all about. We come to find that when you, if you die and you are dead in your unsaved sins, the unconfessed sins, you are going to have a new body. You are going to have a body that's going to be conducive for hell. When we hit our, hand, our finger with a hammer, it hurts. But the pain and anguish we suffer on earth is nothing compared to what you're going to feel when you're in, when you're in hell. Because the body that we're going to receive, I don't want to say we, the body that people will receive is a body that's going to be a million times more sensitive to any kind of pain, any kind of torment, any kind of torture. We also discovered as we listened to what Christ had said about hell, that hell is a place where you're going to be able to see, you're going to be able to hear, you're going to be able to speak very logically, you're not going to be screaming out because you're in blistering pain from fire. Jesus never said that anybody in hell is going to be on fire. But he did talk about fire. We thought, well, what's he talking about? He's talking about a very fiery atmosphere of what hell is going to be like, where you're going to be tortured and tormented for all eternity. We also came to realize that uh, the, the rich man that he was talking about that died and went to a place called Hades, which, by the way, is a holding tank until Jesus Christ returns. And he, had, he was in the holding tank. Lazarus was in heaven. The rich man could see heaven, but Lazarus couldn't see hell. We also discovered, therefore, that people in heaven are not going to see people in hell. The people in hell are going to always be able to see heaven. Also, in Mark chapter 9, verse 46, Jesus let it, let it be known that people that are going to hell are going to get their own absolute personal worm. It's not going to be a crawly little creature. It's going to be a memory bank, whereas you're always going to remember all the times that you had privilege that God tried to get somebody to send your way to get you to come to church, to get your life right, to, to totally be surrendered to Christ. And you're always going to remember all those times you said, no thanks, I don't have, it's, it's my life, I'm going to do it my way, don't tell me what to do. You're always, always, always going to remember all the privileges and opportunities that you had to try to get it right and to have accepted Christ, but now you're going to be stuck in a place called hell. You're going to see people enjoying heaven, but you're not going to enjoy it yourself. And so that's basically what hell is really all about. Amen? And hell is not no place that anybody wants to be. Well, this morning we're going to kick it into gear in the second part, and I want to talk about the judgment of hell. The judgment of hell. How many of you remember in 1952 to 1961, it was a nine-year program, it was called This Is Your Life. Anybody remember that? They would take an elderly person, if I remember correctly, and they would put that person in a chair facing the, the audience. Behind the person was a curtain. Behind the curtain would be several people that would show up, and they would talk to the person in a chair, and they would try to jog their memory about an incident, an experience, or what have you, and try to get the person in the chair to think, who is it behind the, the curtain? And so it was, you know, finally it would come that they would say, okay, I know who you are. And so it was called, This Is Your Life. Well, I want you to understand, the great white throne judgment is the judgment we're going to be talking about this morning. The great white throne judgment that God has waiting is God's version of, This Is Your Life. And let me say this about the great white throne judgment. It is the very last event that is going to take place before the unfolding of eternity, of a new heaven 
and a new uh, a new earth that is going to take place. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 20 or 22. So all said, this new place, uh, of, uh, of this old place called hell I'm speaking of, is we're going to look at the participants that are actually involved there. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. It said, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. Now the hymn that's being spoken of here is none other than who? Jesus. Jesus Christ. He's the one that's seated on the throne. He's ruling and reigning over all mankind in the fulfillment of the destiny of every human being according to the prophetic word of God that's found prophetically in Scripture. He's seated on the great white throne. White stands symbolically for holiness. It stands for purity. Throne stands for sovereignty. It also symbolizes uh, ruler or, or ruling. And so Jesus Christ is going to be seated on the great white throne and in all his love and all his glory and all his holiness and in all his sovereignty, he is going to be the one that is going to take the final judgment rule over all those who have been found that never gave their life to Jesus Christ. Amen? But I want you to see what's going to take place right before the great white throne judgment. It's going to be a time where Christ is going to be coming back to the earth, and he is going to dwell on the earth for a thousand years. And in that thousand year period, he is going to have Satan and all of his followers, those who have never given their life to Christ, and they are going to be put in a pit. Christ is going to reign over the world, and at the end of that thousand year millennial time, then he's going to release Satan one last time from the pit. Satan is going to have one more opportunity to try to overcome God as well as Jesus Christ himself. He's going to assault, and with him are going to be all the people that were born in the millennium. They are the ones that have never given their life to Christ, and they are going to fight. But when this, it's all said and done, you are going to find that Jesus Christ is going to conquer. He's going to win, and with that, then Jesus Christ is going to sit down at the great white throne, and he's going to begin his judgment over mankind and again you don't want to be there you don't want to be there john chapter 5 verse 22 we read these words for the father judges no one but has committed all judgment to the son that all should honor the son just as they honor the father he who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him and then john goes on in verse 27 and he says this and he has given him authority God has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Why is, why is that important? So the question is, why is Jesus doing the judging? Because it's going to be a man judging a man. Because Jesus Christ absolutely identifies with mankind. Everybody says, well, you know, he went through what he went through, but he was God. He could endure it. He laid down his deity. He took on the fullness of humanity. And that's why it's said about him that he was the son of man. Matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 5, you will find that it says there, every temptation that had ever come upon all human beings had all compilationally been poured upon him. He suffered all the temptations that we suffer. But the difference was he did not fall prey to it. And because he did not fall prey to any of the torment and torture and temptation, then he can identify what it means to have self-control. And because he was the one that was able to maintain self-control, he, the man, is going to now judge humanity. He's also called the Son of God. And as the Son of God, He identifies with the holiness, the purity, and the justice of Almighty God. So here you have Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, is going to judge all mankind in total righteous judgment. Amen? Total righteous judgment. And it says here, in verse 17, chapter 17, verse 31 of Acts, it says here, because... He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. We're talking about God. 
Because I'm going to put he in, I'm going to replace it with God. Because God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. He's already got the appointment set. In other words, the world coming to an end is already set mm -hmm. by Almighty God. It's an already done deal. Before the world was ever formed, God knew how many years he would give the world and he would give mankind. So it says here, because God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So here he's attesting to the truth. You want to know who's going to be judging the living and the dead or the dead that have not accepted Christ? It's going to be my son. And to prove it that it's going to be my son and not me, God is saying, he is the one that I have raised from the dead. So we come to identify Jesus Christ is going to be the judicial system that is going to righteously judge all those that have died in their unsaved state. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 and 13 says this, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Church, every unsaved person from the beginning of history up until the final moment, every unsaved person is going to go into a place called Hades. It is a holding tank until Jesus Christ comes. And when Jesus Christ comes, you are going to find then he is going to judge all those who have never accepted him as Lord and Savior. The qualifications for those who are ready to be judged is found in verse 15. Anyone whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now understand something. Christians will not be at that judging court. Christians will not be there. If you are a born-again believer and you die and, you're, and, and, from, and you leave this world, you are not going to go to Hades. The Bible makes it very clear. Paul the Apostle made it very clear. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, he said this, these words, We are confident, yes indeed, to be absent from the body, to be in the presence of the Lord. The moment you die, you are immediately going to be translated out of this mortal body, and you too, you are going to receive an immortal, immortal body. The Bible says that right now we see Christ as like through a fog glass. But when we see him on the other side of death, we will see him as, as he truly is, and we will be like him. And so you come to realize we are going to have a body that is going to be like that of Christ. We are going to have a body that is going to be conducive to heaven. And you are going to come before the judgment seat of Christ. You're not going to be judged to see if you get into heaven or not. You're going to be judged by the treasures you acquired while you were here on this earth. Why is that important? Because your, your treasures are going to absolutely denote what level you're going to have in heaven. There are different levels in heaven. That's why Jesus said, John the Baptist, he's the greatest among men, but he's the least in the kingdom of heaven. When you get into Matthew chapter 5, around verse 22, Jesus also, once again, alludes to the fact that there are different levels in heaven. So you're going to find that when you come before the judgment seat of Christ, it's not a matter, am I going to get in or not? It's a matter that you're going to be judged by your treasures. What are your treasures? Your treasures are the souls that you have won for the benefit of the kingdom of God. And how do you win souls? You go out and you become the harvester. That's why I've been preaching on the harvester. If you are not one opening your mouth and telling those that are dying in the family, in the workplace, in the community, wherever you're at, if you're not telling them about Jesus Christ, their blood will be held upon your head, the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel. But here, if you are an absolute harvester and you have treasures to be shown, then you are going to have, depending on how faithful were you with the time, with the treasures, with the gifts, with the talents, 
with everything God gave you to work with while you were on this earth, how faithful and honorable were you to propagate the truth to those who were dying because of their unsaved nature. Now, if you don't make one effort, one time you open your mouth to anybody, you're going to get into heaven by the skin of your teeth. And you're going to be at the lowest level of heaven. You say, well, what's the big deal? Look at Luke chapter 19. You will come to find there Jesus also alludes to the understanding that you are going to have ownership of a certain percentage of heaven. Heaven is going to be a place of utopia. Heaven is going to be like the Garden of Eden without sin. And in heaven, according to Luke chapter 19, you are going to find that the wholeness of heaven is going to be a society just like the societies on the earth. When God told Moses to set up society within the promised land and then Joshua took them in, the society was all made up according to the diagram of God. And the diagram of God actually uh, mirrors the diagram of our societies today. You're going to have judicial systems, you're going to have government, you're going to have leadership, you're going to have administrators, it's right there in the Bible. You're going to have it all. And you are going to have a certain percentage of ownership. It's right there in Luke chapter 19. But you're not going to have any of that if you don't open your mouth and win the lost. You're going to just barely get in, and you're not going to be, as the Bible says, an administrator. Now let me say this. If you open your mouth and you're telling people about Jesus, and you, you know, they're not, they're not coming. You're making every honest effort, and they're not listening. They're not, they're not paying attention to you. That's okay. The Bible says, one will plant the seed. God will send another to water it. Yes. But God ultimately will bring the growth. So you plant the seed, you're doing your part. There will be treasures that are waiting for you in heaven. But I want you to know that this, this great white throne judgment, there's not going to be any Christians that are going to be there. What's going to happen at that very moment of time? Jesus is going to unleash Hades. He's going to take all the souls of the unsaved and he is going to bring them and they are going to come before him and then there's going to be judgment that is going to come upon them. And it's going to be righteous judgment as I keep repeating. And I want you to know that that courtroom activity is going to be like none other. There's not going to be a prosecuting attorney. There's not going to be a defense attorney. There's not going to be any appeal. Why? Because that particular courtroom is going to be handled with perfect judgment by a perfect judge. So here you're going to find that all the unsaved throughout all history are now going to come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And they are going to get their final due of what's due them. Amen? I want you to see that's who the participants are. Now I want, to, I want to show you why is it that God wished to have the great white throne judgment. First of all, the reason for it is to totally purge sin from the universe. It's going to be the final event, as I've already told you, but it's also going to be the last time that sin is ever going to be mentioned and or dealt with. Look what it says in chapter 20 of Revelation. Look at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. In other words, when they are now emptied out of Hades, about to go into a place called hell, there's not going to, not going to be any place for them to hide. Why? Because the heavens are going to be rolled up, the earth is going to be set ablaze, it is going to absolutely be uh, annihilated, there's not going to be anything left. But there's not going to be yet a new heaven and a new earth to come down. Why? Because sin is still in the atmosphere. Not until Christ deals with the last individual and sends them off to hell, then the atmosphere will be cleaned and then you are going to have a new heaven and a new earth and a new government and a new system and Jesus Christ will be El Presidente. He will be the absolute chief and the, and the government, the city, the community, everything that we're going to see in heaven will be pillared not on man's laws, but on God's word. 
That's how, the, that's how the new heaven and the new earth is going to be at this very moment of time. Amen? So you come to find the reason for this judgment, first and foremost, is to purge sin from all the universe. The second reason for this judgment is to reveal the perfect justice of God. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. And the dead will be judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Verse 13 says... And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Now you and I know, and I'll tell you how important this is. You and I know, if you are a born-again believer, you can't save yourself. You tried. You thought you could. You thought you could get a handle on your addiction, on your behavior, on your bad, bad thoughts, whatever. You can't do it. And I want you to know, religion can't save you. As a matter of fact, a lot of people want to say, when they talk about you, if you're a born-again believer, they say, boy, they're religious. I hate that. Because you're not religious. You're relation, relational. We are into a relationship with Christ. Amen? Amen? Religion was manufactured by Satan. Why? To bring the mighty walls for the body of Christ. Why was it important? Because God moves where there's unity. But Satan moves where there's disjointment, where there's disunity. Because Satan knows what it says in the book of Deuteronomy. That if one can put to flight a thousand, and two can put to flight ten thousand, can you imagine if an entire body was joined together by nothing in dividing them, that we could terrorize the powers of darkness? So you come to find Satan is the orchestrator of religion. So that he can bring a divide to the body of Christ. But I want you to know, religion is not also going to get you to heaven. But if you are a born-again believer, you know that God says, there's nothing good in man, we are all sinners, and we need a Savior. And therefore, for those who are born again, you've made confession unto Jesus and said, I need you into my life. I want you to turn me around. I want you to straighten me out. I want you to be my Lord, which means take over, and my God, and my Savior. But the unsaved, they also know that they are sinners. But they are saying, don't, don't mess with me. This is my life. I'll deal with my own sins. I know how to handle it. And here, the time had ended up. Hebrews 9.27 came into play for them. And their appointment of death came at a known hour like a thief in the night. And then the ball game was over. As long as you have breath in your, your lungs, you still have a chance. But the moment you, you take your last breath, the ball game of the test is over. You've been placed on this earth as a testing ground. Either you're going to accept me and, re and receive me as your Lord and Savior, or you're going to denounce me. And so you come to find these people that are saying, it's my life, I'll do as I please. They felt that they're going to work out their salvation on their own. They don't need Christ. And what it says here is Jesus is going to judge them according to the criteria of their own works. He's going to let the criteria of their bad behavior be the rule of judgment that's going to determine the level of their punishment. Oh my. It says here, he will judge them according to their work. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be judged by a perfect God when I'm imperfect. I don't want, I don't want to be standing before Jesus Christ who is a perfect Righteous judge. I don't want to be like the rich, young, the, the, the rich man who died and says, Hey, I'm okay. I'm not all that bad. I want you to know, when God begins to judge, it's going to be judged individually. God's not going to be like a high school teacher judging you on a curve. How many of you have been in high school and you loved when they said, I, didn't, I never loved when they said, you're going to have a test. I didn't care for that. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to have a test. I didn't study the last six weeks. But... <laughs> But they would tell you that the test is going to be judged on a curve. And I liked that when I was in a class with a bunch of other dummies. <laughs> then I had a chance. But if you were in a, in a class with a bunch of poindexters, people that all they did, they studied, they prepared, they turned in their homework, they got straight A's, bam! They threw the curve right out the window, and everybody else either got D's and or flunked. Amen? Well, I want you to know that God doesn't grade on a curve. He grades individually, and he grades according to your works, and he will grade according to his righteous standard. And the third reason why God had brought forth the great white throne judgment, so as to set the understanding of the level of hell you're going to be at. 
Oh my. I told you, heaven has a level. Well, well, I want you to know that hell has levels as well. Hell has levels as well. Everyone in hell is going to be at a different level. All sin is not equal in hell. It's all based, you say, well, I thought all sin was equal in the eyes of God. Yeah, if you accept Christ at the cross, all sins are forgiven. I don't care if you're a rapist, a murderer, or just a liar. You're all equal at the cross, and all sin is erased. But when you don't accept Christ, all your sin is going to be exposed. And your sins, your sinful nature, is going to be the criteria that's going to determine the level of hell. Some people in hell are going to think that they're living in a little bit like heaven, as opposed to others. If you are a good person, if you're a good person, I'll show you this example again. I think I shared it a little bit the last time. If you're a good person, but you've never gone to church, you've never accepted Christ, you've done all the good, wonderful things, I want you to know you're going to hell. You're going to go straight to hell. You're not going to pass go. You're not going to collect $200. You're going straight to hell. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man or no woman or nobody is going to get unto the Father but through me. He also said in John chapter 10, I am the gate to the sheep pen. That I am the gate, no one will get into the sheep pen but through me. He said if someone is found in the sheep pen and doesn't have the wardrobe of white, whiteness of righteousness upon them, they are going to be thrown out because they are thieves, they are robbers. I want you to know that Jesus Christ lets it be known unless one believes in their heart and confesses with their lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, unless you do that, you're not getting to heaven. Now that's one person, a good person, a kind person. But somebody that doesn't accept Christ, they're going to hell. If you're going to have a different level than that of a Hitler who had killed mass murderers, uh, the, the serial killers, whatever, rapists. You don't want to be. You don't want to be in hell with these kind of people, anyhow, right? And they're going to have. And if, they, if we say Hitler, I don't know about Hitler. Maybe he confessed his sins. We don't know what happened between the moment he closed his eyes to this world, whatever. But under the pretense that he didn't. Hitler and people like him are going to have a lower level than that of the people that are good people that just never accepted Christ. And hell, as we found out last week, hell is, uh, two weeks ago, hell is also called the great abyss. It's called the, uh, the empty pit. It's going, to, it's going to be a place where you're going to go lower and lower and lower and lower. And your problems, your pain, your agony is going to constantly be there. And there's no sedation for people, no sedatives they can take when they're in hell. And so that's what's going on here. It's just like our system and our government system. We have misdemeanors and we have felonies, right? Well, I want you to know when you're in the courtroom before Christ, there's going to be some people that are going to get in with misdemeanors, some people with major felonies. And the people, as I repeat, the people in hell are going to think it's not all that bad. But it's going to be bad. It's going to be a lot of suffering. They can see heaven but they can't get into heaven. They can't enjoy all the beauty of heaven. I want you to see something here. This is going to really be one of the points that I want you to hold on to. Matthew chapter 11, look at verse 20. Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. Which were done, he said, for if the mighty works, let me go on again, I missed the part. Then he rebuked the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Karazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable, tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Now, I want you to see this. Go down to verse 23, and he says, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. Will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Everybody say that. It would have remained until this day. But I say to you, Capernaum, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now, here it is. Capernaum, 
was a wealthy, wealthy society. They were a transport society right near the Cape. And all the ships came in, and all the merchants sold and picked up a variety of goods from Capernaum. Capernaum, the people at large, were very wealthy, and they felt that they were very spiritually healthy because they put their spiritual health equal to their financial health. And so they thought that they had it all together, just like America today. And they had the best of synagogues, the most intriguing, the most uh, ornamental synagogues that you would ever see. And they would come, and they would go to the synagogue every Sabbath. They looked so prompt and, and prim and proper. They would sit there every Saturday evening, and they would listen to the rabbi's teaching. And they were think, thinking to themselves, thinking to themselves that they were high and lifted up above other people. Jesus came along and said, you who are lifted up in heaven, in their own mind, in their own mind, you are about to be brought down to Hades. Then he goes on and he says, for if the miracle working grace that I performed in you would have been privileged to be seen by Sodom and Gomorrah, now, Sodom and Gomorrah was the most perverse culture that ever existed in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, it was so bad that God said, I've had enough. It has heaped up upon me. So he, do, he threw down fiery blazes of, of sulfur on them and burnt up Sodom and Gomorrah because they were nothing but homosexuals perversion, debauchery, they were having sex with animals, anything that they wanted to do. This is what they were doing. God said, I've had enough. But Jesus is saying, although they were more vile than you, Capernaum, more perverse than you could even imagine, Capernaum, but the fact is, because I had privileged you to see my miracle-working power of grace, that they were not privileged to see in the Old Testament. When the day of the great white throne judgment comes, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you, Capernaum. So understand this. American unbelievers, oh my goodness, are you in a bad shape. You American unbelievers are in a whole lot of trouble. Why do I say that? Because America, within the borders of the United States of America, we have Christian television 24-7, Christian radio 24-7. You can listen to a sermon any given time throughout the day. You have book and Bible stores. We have Bibles uh, that, that go on and on that you can get any version that you want. There are churches all over the land. There's opportunity for people to hear the gospel of God's grace and salvation. But because people say, no, I want you to know the measure of the light of the knowledge of the gospel that God had provided to the American public because they said, no, thank you, and died and went to hell, you are going to find that the light that they had been given is going to have a direct effect on the level of, ju of judgment and not just merely their actions of works. Not just merely their actions of works. So if you in America are not hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, or you've heard the gospel and you are not following the decree of what Jesus said, Oh my goodness, not only are you going to find that it's going to be worse for you than even some vile individual of another culture that never heard the truth, it's going to be worse for you because you have been privileged to have heard the truth, but you negated it. You walked away from it. And therefore, the light that was given to you as a privilege of God's grace is going to be the effect of the level of your judgment and not merely your actions, not merely your works. Look at Mark chapter 12, verse 38. Then he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These individuals will receive condemnation. Isn't that what he said? No, that's not what he said. They will receive 
greater, greater condemnation. Because not all condemnation is going to be equal at the great white throne judgment. Because of the fact that if you have knowledge of God's word, and the, and the scribes, they had incredible knowledge of the word. They were the biblical authors of the word. They knew everything about the word. As a matter of fact, the high priests and the scribes, they were there with Herod. When the wise men showed up and said, can you tell us where he that is born the king of the Jews has been born? And Herod said, I don't know. So he goes and he, ha he asks his scribes and the high priests, and they say, yeah, we know where. And they look in the Bible, they look in the Torah, and they come to find that he says, according to Micah the prophet 720 years ago, Micah said he would be born in Bethlehem in a manger. And they knew the word, and they were only seven miles from Bethlehem. But the word that they had knowledge of, light of, was of no value to them. And Jesus was saying that when you are like a scribe, when you are like a Pharisee, when you are a teacher of the word, when you are a preacher of the word, when you are an evangelist even today in modern day, and you are a prophet, when you are someone that I have given privilege to have light, to have knowledge, and you don't follow it yourself, you are going to have greater condemnation that's going to come your way. Even today, in our modern day, people that are, that are called to preach are going to be judged even more intently, the Bible says in 2 Timothy. So it's important. Amen? In the book of Revelation, chapter 18, look at verse 6. Jesus says this to John on the Isle of Patmos. He gives him a notification. He says, render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works. He's talking to her. He's talking about is the last leader on earth that is about to come that's going to be filled with the Antichrist. He says, repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she had mixed, mixed double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same manner, measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow. And will not see sorrow, therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. In other words, Jesus said, give her the due that her works deserve. Give her the due that her works deserve. So every sinner and every sin that is there at the white, great white throne judgment is going to have a different degree, a level degree of judgment. It's all going to be based on your particular works. And the fourth and last reason why the great throne judgment exists that God brought in is to reveal the responsibility of man. Man is not going to be able to say, wait a minute, God, it's your fault. <laughs> Who's going to have the audacity to say that anyhow? Who's going to say, it's your fault? And here they're standing before the judicial judge of righteousness, Jesus Christ. And as they stand in that courtroom, no, no defense attorney, no prosecuting attorney, no appeal. And they will have the final say to say whatever they want to say. And they're going to argue with, with Jesus. And they're going to say, wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on. Am I not a good person? Did I not give my, my children a kiss every day? I love my children. I love my wife. I never cheated on my wife. I was good to the neighbors, good to the neighborhood. I was a good person. <coughs> and then you're going to find that Jesus said, but that's not what you're here for. That's irrelevant. That's not what you're here for. It would be like this. You get, you get accused of something, and you have to go to the Newcastle courtroom, and there you have to stand before a judge. And maybe they got you for drunken driving. Third offense. Make it easy on you. You're going to at least get, what, 90 days in, in jail now for a third, fourth offense? I don't know what it is. Thank God I never had one of those. But nonetheless, you're going to stand before the judge. You're going to say, well, wait, judge, hold on a minute. I'm not a bad person. I love my kids. I love my wife. I don't, I don't cheat on my wife. I'm good to the neighborhood. I'm good to the... I go to church. I'm a good person. And the judge is going to say... I'm so glad that you love your kids. I'm glad that they know that they have a loving father. I'm glad that you love your wife and that you are, you are true to your wife. You never cheat on your wife. I'm so glad 
that you are good to the neighbors. I'm so glad that you're good to older people. I'm so glad you're good. And you go to church, but that's not what you're here for. The, rele the relevance of what you're here for, because you have a drinking problem. And it's that drinking problem that's going to cause you now to go see some time in a county jail. So understand something. When you go before the great white throne judgment, if that be you, you're not going to be able to get out of it. You're not going to be able to say, well, it's God's fault. It's her fault. It, no, your works. He, it says that he will judge you according to your works. My works won't be in your book. Your works won't be in my book. We are going to deal with our own judgmental criteria. We are going to deal with our own sins unless we accept Christ. Then you're not going to be there whatsoever. Amen? Let me tell you, and I end it with this. Perfect people will not be at the great white throne judgment. Did you hear me? Perfect people won't be there. You say, well, wait, I'm not perfect. Yes, you are. Because the moment you accept Christ, you are, being, you are being sanctified while on the earth, which means that you are being cleansed. But the moment you close your eyes to this world, you are immediately perfected. You will be complete into the perfect symbolism and truism of Christ. You will be perfect standing before Jesus Christ and Almighty God in heaven. Have you ever asked anybody that maybe you know and say, are you going to go to heaven? Yeah, I think so. Why do you think so? Because I'm a good person. Well, here's what you answer them. Good people don't go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. Perfect people go to heaven. And the only way you can be perfect is when you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. When you ask Him to come into your life, and you ask Him to be the Lord, which means, you know what Lord means? I surrender everything into your reins. Amen. You take the steering wheel. <coughs> you drive the car. You drive my life. I'm getting in the passenger seat because I mess things up when I drive. And I'm going to have you steer. I'm going to have you take me where you want me to go. And when you completely surrender to Christ, then and only then are you going to see that you're not going to end up going into the great white throne judgment. I want to say this be, uh, as we are closing here. When people come to the front and or they raise their hands when there is a statement of saying, anybody want to raise their hands? To this? Anybody want to accept Jesus Christ as Lord, Lord and Savior? A lot of people open at that moment because of emotionalism, problems, issues, whatever it is that they're going through. Many of people will raise their hand, and everybody else gets excited. And we'll have a sinner's prayer, and they go through the motion of the sinner's prayer. Sometimes they even come to the altar. The organization I belong to, the organization of any organization of, of a denomination, they always ask for, you need to give us the numbers. How many people got saved this month? I never give it. And the reason I never give it, because I don't know. See, the Bible says... The Bible says that, that man looks at the outward, but I look at the heart. And so they might be into the delusion of emotionalism. Maybe emotionally they just raise their hand for the moment. And then you wonder, why are they out? Why are they not in the church anymore? Why are they out there back in the world again? Because they made a mistake. They confessed with their lips, but their hearts were not in it. And again, I repeat what Jesus said. If you believe in your heart, heart and confess with your lips that Christ is Lord then you are saved a lot of people they confess with their lips God said through Isaiah the people of Israel they, they praise me with their lips but their hearts are far from me that if your heart that if your heart is not with him while you're accepting him where's your heart your heart is out there in the world the Bible says where your treasure is there your heart be also. So if you are out there chasing the wind, chasing the immorality, chasing the perversion, chasing the addictions, chasing the filth, chasing all the stupid stuff that's out there that Satan is trying to snag you and bring you back. If your heart is out there and here verbally you're saying, but I accept Jesus Christ, I want you to know you are on your way to hell. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You have not made a true confession.
Now, I don't take records when people first raise their hand. God gave me the insight a long time ago. Just sit back and watch. Just sit back and watch. And Jesus said, you will know those, who are, know those that are mine. You will know those that are mine by the fruit that they bear. If I don't see good fruit in you, I know there's no change in you. I know nothing has changed. You have gone through nothing but lip service. And what Jesus said, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because he can't stand pretense. He can't stand pretense. So um, I, I said that for this. At any given time in your life, you believe in your heart that you are saved. I'm not going to be preaching on hell again for a number of months, whatever the Lord ever lays on my, my heart. But I want you to know this could be it. If you are not truly, truly saved, if you don't have, as the Bible says, if you don't have a hunger and thirst for the Word of God, if you are not in a continuous prayer moment, with Christ every day that you allow for Him to lead you and speak to you, if you are not fasting and praying over major issues that you announce for Him to come and take over, if you are not one that you are, you are having a hunger for more of Christ, more of His presence, then something's wrong. Something's wrong. If you find yourself hungry for more of the things out there than more of being in the house of God, not to forsake the assembling of yourself, in the house of God, what's the reason for that? Not just to look pretty, so that you can be prayed for and pray one for another. Why? Because when you pray one for another, it allows the enemy not to have any foothold in your life. That's what the church is about. Amen? Amen. But if you are, if any of those things I just announced, you don't have a hunger and thirst for the Word of God, a hunger and thirst for the presence of God, if you are not seeking Christ, if you are not going after Him with everything within you, but you find yourself that you're out there in the world with unsaved people, then the Bible says bad company corrupts good character. If you're out there and those people have lured you away, because see, you're not fighting against flesh and blood. You are fighting against powers, rulers, principalities, and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. Those people out there that you say are the, my friends, my relatives, whoever, they have a spiritual demon that is through them that is coming at you to lure you away because ultimately Satan doesn't want you to get too close to Christ. He's okay with you thinking you're all right, but he's going to laugh, he's going to laugh his head off when it comes to the great white throne judgment, and there you are. And now you're going to argue with God and say, well, wait, 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 hold on a minute. Didn't I go to church one time and confess Christ? Too late. Your heart wasn't in it. Your heart wasn't in it. So make sure, make absolute sure that you are in right standing with God. So for that to be said, I'm just going to have a, a sinner's prayer. I want you to all say it with me. But I don't want you to just say the words. I want your heart to be in it. I want you to believe in your heart. Believe what? Believe that Jesus Christ came for me. Yes. Say it for, for yourself, for me. That he came for me. He lived amongst men. And he died. And he was buried. But he rose again. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father, inter interceding for me. When you believe that, and then you confess him as your Lord and Savior, and you truly believe that, you will be saved. And then let the hunger begin. Don't denounce when he begins to put a hunger in you. Stay away from the things out there in the world because this world is going to be burnt up in fire and everything within it is all going to be absolutely destroyed. The love of money, the love of people, the love of cars, the love of houses, everything you can imagine that's going to lure you away is all going to be burnt up in fire. Amen? Amen. So let's say this, this sinner's prayer together as we close. Heavenly Father. I'm coming before you, God, thanking you that you gave me your son. He is my guard. He is my sanctity. He is the one that will save me. And now, I'm surrendering my life completely over to him. Jesus, I want you to be not only my Savior, but my Lord. I want you to take control 
of my life. Remove all the baggage that I brought on myself. And I'm asking, Lord Jesus, that you totally heal me. In my spirit, my soul, and my mind. I want to be a new creation. Redeveloped in you, Lord God. Jesus, I thank you. I'm believing in my heart. I'm confessing with my lips. I want to make sure that I'm doing things right this time. And give me a hunger and a thirst for more of you, more of your presence, more of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise be to God. God is good. The great white throne judgment. I told a lot of people I want you to hear about it because I don't want you to go there. And that's the truth. You don't want to go there. God has made a way for us. We can bypass that judgment scene. Amen? Amen. Maybe you're dismissed.